being Italian or having Italian parents is is irrelevant because it everything about you gives you a certain experience. And as I was growing up, there was oh god, loads of weird religious printy type thing so there was some form of visual culture when I was growing up be it a picture of Jesus or Mary or something like that, that variety so I think it gave me some sort of beginning in a way into visual culture when if I wasn't have if I didn't have access to galleries or anything of a more conventional nature and also when I managed to go to get to Italy with my family, it's also going to a very different culture. And because my language wouldn't be strong enough, therefore you'd be more viewing the place in a visual way. So also so like the landscapes and the seascapes and just seeing how all the houses will be piled up on top of the mountains and everything. So all that visual information, I think, it's, you know, it gets stored in your head and at some stage you find a way to use it and it becomes bigger and something different, but it's still there in a way. Following my foundation course, which was at, um, which was at Shelley Park, which, which was originally, from what I was told, was uh, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. I then went to um, Reading University, which was a really free space and I had a team of um, lecturers there who'd been there since the 70s, 80s. So there was a really cohesive nature to the whole uh, space. I, it was good to be amongst these people. Uh, they had uh, Amakin Torren, who's known for pulping up materials and then turning them into artworks, transforming them into another 2D, 3D, whatever form, and uh, had um, Stephen Buckley as the professor. And he was a uh, very established painter, very important abstract painter who's actually had uh, many retrospectives at the Tate Britain in the past. And uh, Peter Kalkoff, who unfortunately has passed, but he was, he was quite a geometric painter of a very good reputation, showed with a very strong London gallery for many years. And he, he studied at the same time as Roger Cook, who was, or both Peter and Roger were my tutors at different times. And Roger was more of a theoretician about art. He originally was involved in painting, but got more involved into the background, into certain philosophers, and how it related to how you would read into a painting. After Reading, I then went to uh, Brighton to do an MA. And basic, I was there for two years. And for that period, I felt I'd had, I needed a break from painting. And I, for those two years, I was doing text works for the majority of that period of time. Yeah, I think there's, there's one I did, which was on a uh, plastic sheet with um, vinyl lettering, which said, I'd like to have any dog, but I'd prefer to have a sausage dog. In about 2010, no, 2009, 2010, um, I started working from imagery of artists. And I would... Um, I was collecting up loads of images of artists in their studios, very renowned artists. I was doing Albacks, Boys, a bit, very distinctive artists, artists who, if you see an image of them, you know immediately that is that person. So I did a number of small scale oils, one of which is there. Behind. And um, I did a small number of those and they were just, that was the first stage into my journey into just exploring what the art world was. And that is a performance by Bruce Nauman where he's walking a circle. And from, um, and even, even then I was working in a mo mostly tonal way to allow the subject matter to actually uh, be ahead to be more important than the colours it was actually executed in. So 
and I did quite a few small scale ones and then I was actually then I moved to a larger scale with um, which that suiting one is an example of I was working with you know renowned artists really well known ones that the, you know the public would know of and that were of great relevance but but then I moved into taking photos of artists in their actual studios to have to actually work with um, artists I knew and actually have the experience of um, lesser known people who are having the same experience as these artists and also working from their studios and how they how their works were stored and how they painted and recording these and doing oils and inks based on those as well. With the artists I've chosen, they've done something that um, has a directness that I'm hoping for. In terms of my paintings, I find that the thing that takes more time is the contemplation prior to the work. Because I think that if I'm going to do a truly successful painting, it would ideally take weeks of thought before, but merely happen in half an hour, and it just comes down naturally, and there's no fight, and it's there. Because I find that when you're fighting with the canvas, it's the image, it, it can get a bit convoluted, and you've got to be able to just naturally put things down where they need to, not correct them, and let them be as they be. I find that with each painting that they have to, is trying to get a presence from a painting is the difficulty. And that happens very rarely and every year or so you will do a painting where you will just get a weird high from doing that one painting and the rest of the day nothing will irritate you because you did that painting and it is perfect. But it is such a rare feeling, but I think that's one of the big reasons why people paint, because when that happens, it doesn't matter if everything else in your life is rubbish. That one day is perfect because you did that painting. And I think that's a good moment in your life, and it's just that I've had it a few times, I'm waiting for the next time it's going to happen again. <laughs> Whenever I feel that I'm getting into a set of way of working and everything's getting a bit too easy and ob obvious, I will always change things around. So I like I will go from oils to enamels or oils to acrylics. I'll change the color scheme. I'll change the scale. I'll do whatever I can just to move things around a bit so that it keeps it fresh for me. Because if it's boring for me doing the artworks, then no one's going to want to look at them once I've actually done the artwork and it's finished. More early on, I was interested in artists like Craig Aitchison with his very simplified figurative forms. But um, as I um, managed to um, gain more knowledge in terms of the artworks, I got, I discovered artists like Auerbach and Kossoff and all of the, and there's artists where it's more of an um, instinctive approach to the work and where the texture was much more visible. The, um, the way he uses texture and the way he actually was forced to use a very su a very minimal colour scheme early on in his career due to poverty. And I felt, I feel that that type of uh, simplicity and directness has gone into the works that I do now. So when, because when you think about the drawings he has downstairs at the National Gallery that are based upon the masters upstairs and the way that he captures them in just a few strokes and barely anything there, but it says everything it needs to. And it's so difficult to, with drawing, to do something so simple but with so much power, which is one of those things I'm always striving to do. And whatever you do, it always comes close to, to that, but it's never going, going to have the strength you find in other people's works because you will always be seeing the faults in what you do. So I found that with my paintings, the use of texture is important, but it's trying to do it in a way which also suits the subject matter, because you don't want to have unnecessary texture that takes away from what you're painting at the same time. So it's trying to get everything to balance. So everything's just enough in the image. 
and it just holds together. Also in terms of artists like um, Basilisk, is um, the way he um, will use very stark figuration and it's very direct and the scale he uses. It's, there's qualities in his works where I'd love to be able to work at that larger scale and see, see where my works could then develop and see but there's certain ideas I get which I know I need to be bigger but it's how big they need to be to gain the strength where they are you know they've gained they've become what they're meant to be and they're not just a model or a study towards that perfect stage the biggest of mine is the, the one that was in the um, in the Royal Academy that's the largest scale which is about that high by that wide it's good to actually have these shows where basically I was given the opportunity to show older works so and the actual person around the galley wanted to show my older works and it's nice that when people do show things that are like four, five, six years old, but the majority of the time it's always about what is your most contemporary, what is the newest, and they don't care about what has come before and how that has actually informed what you're now doing. So it, it was good to get a fresh insight on what I've done in the past and show things I've never exhibited before. And they just come to life on those walls, but they're not in the studio, they're on white walls, they're well spaced, and that's when a painting has a personality. When it's just in a stack in, the, in a room, you, you can't really get anything out of it. You need to get them on walls and seen by people. And this is an image of um, a, a monk scream painting that was sold one or two years ago. I, I like the whole scenery of how they set up an auction house and it's like a, a mini exhibition and all the aprons and it's got its etiquette, which I think is, it's, it's a place where I've actually gone to an auction ever, but I would like to go to one. I've never gone to an art auction, but I think I just, I keep my arms down for sure. I'm not going to take any risks on that, but I would like to go to one just to see what, you know, the, the atmosphere that I was trying to convey there and see what it's like in reality as well. But with this painting, I actually titled it as the value that the actual painting sold for, which was 74 million. So I think that that's basically the news headline of our art world. It's about how much did it sell for and did it sell more than another painter and all the, about the escalating values. And I think that, you know, that's an interesting aspect about there's the quality of the artwork, but then there's the commercial va value and they're totally different things when you think about art, because you don't value how much it's worth. You value what you see in front of your eyes and what you want to spend half an hour staring at. Because if I find a painting I love, I'll be in front of it walking backwards and forwards for half an hour and I cannot leave the painting because there's always something more it can give you all of the time and you're looking for that little detail it's like um, when they had um, show of self-portraits by Howard Hodgkin and they had his last self-portrait, which was that gigantic painting and it just brought tears to your eyes. It was beautiful and you don't know what put that emotion into that painting, but it was there. It's an abstract image, it's got drips, it's got everything, but somehow there was a personality and a vulnerability to that painting that it's the type of thing that when you appreciate when you experience that you'll just think you're just hoping that one stage in your life you can do that to someone else is something you've done just actually stop them and make them have to spend time with your work when i'm painting it's more i'm lost in the process of trying to turn a piece of canvas into what my head is thinking. So it's just sketching, it's just slowly working into it, putting in the colours, just allowing it just to slowly come to life. And it's just being lost in that action. So 
you will find that you're busy painting for a few hours and you realise once you finish painting you're absolutely starving because you've gone past eating, gone past drinking, gone past anything because painting is what mattered for that period of time. And it could have been like three, four hours and it's just gone in like two seconds and the painting is there. And it's that, that concentration and that disappearance from the world that I like. There's everything around you doesn't exist. All that exists is your brush, the colours and what you're putting them on. And that little world is just a nice place to be, I think.